So pray with me. Don't just listen to me pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for who you are. We are grateful to spend some time with you. Thank you that we just got to come through this Easter season where we recognize and, and uh, we rejoice that you're alive. Lord, teach us. And, uh, and we ask that you'd speak to each of our hearts what we need from you today. And we are ready to receive. And we ask that in Jesus' name. And everybody in the place said, amen. amen. And everybody online said, amen. Yeah, there you go. Okay, you guys can grab a seat. It's nice to see everybody. Happy, happy Lord's Day. Uh, we just started a new series uh, called the, the Foundations of Our Faith. And it's on the basics, but I don't think basics is the right word because it's really what are some of the most important things that we build on uh, as, we, as we follow Christ. So that's what it's all about. And we had, a, we had a meeting this last week talking about the youth. How many of your youth are in here? Would you raise your hand if you're a youth? So uh, we were talking about you behind your back. Sorry. But it was, no, it was really good, though. We, um, we talked about including the youth in the series because uh, it's just the way culture is going and the way uh, our world is going, it's even more important for young people to understand the stuff that we're going to talk about the next six weeks, uh, even more than for us old people. But I wanted to welcome up Lucas Johnston, our youth pastor. I want him to talk about it for a minute. They like you. Yeah, I, so, li I like them. So tell them a little about our decision with youth. Yeah, so um, this was really an idea that sort of spurred or, or came from just some really good conversations with parents within our group. Uh, when Kirk announced this series, um, we had some talks about fundamentally how important it is for our youth to have a solid foundation. Uh, theology matters. Uh, it matters for the youth just as much as it does for us. Um, and it's a building block for their growth as, as, uh, as followers of Christ. So that was sort of the, the origin of the conversation about perhaps having them in with us during this series. So we talked about it, we thought about it, and there were, for me, kind of three pivotal areas. One is that that foundational basis for which we're going to hopefully, um, you know, raise them up in the church. Um, so that was that was the first first idea. Um, then I started thinking. I've always felt it so important that the youth understand that we are all you are all their church family, right? We've talked about that. You've supported them through camp. You've supported them with youth events. Um, they have amazing mentors and people who are praying over them and loving them. Um, and I thought, well, if we're if we're going to do this. Uh, I think it's important as a church family that they see that, that we go through this process together as a church, that they see that our theology is, is, is united and that it's, it's foundational and that we go through it together uh, in hopes that in the home that it will translate, that we can reinforce that and they can see us as, uh, as their parents and mentors be an example of what it is that we're going to go through uh, in this series. I think it's, it's super important. Um, and then the third thing was... You know, our youth are super smart. Like, they can handle this. They can, we can handle. trust them. We can trust them, right? <laughs> like, you know, they ask some questions that, like, blow my mind sometimes. I'm like, you know, I don't know. Ask Kirk, right? Who better to teach that, right? So just all of that coming together through this process, coming out of Easter, we thought this, this is a time for our youth to be, be in here with us through this service, that we all go through it together, um, and that we can build on that on Mondays when we come together uh, as a youth uh, for some fun and festivities and more youth-related type topics, but this will be a really good basis for them to see what it is that we're building as a church and as a church family. So that's, that's why you guys are going to be in here. So, Amazing. Yep. Cool? Yep. Amen. All awesome. right. Thank you, Lucas. You got it. And so, youth, if you are outside, come on in. So we want to have you in here with us for this. And parents, please discuss some of these things with your youth uh, and the kiddos during the week. The uh, Jill will be doing some of the same themes with the elementary kids. So it's going to be awesome to be all on one page. Uh, Donna, thank you. She sent me a podcast this last week, and I listened to it. And, uh, and it was, it was uh, Jen Wilkin and JT English, and they wrote, they wrote a book called uh, You Are a Theologian. And, uh, and it was actually really, really helpful. She was on staff at the Village Church for a long time. Um, but it really made things very practical. 
because uh, it seems like in American churches, we are really good at some things. Like we have strong opinions about all kinds of things. Sometimes those things are not as important as the things that we don't know about the foundations of our faith. And so we, we might know a lot more about baptism than we do about the Trinity. We may know a, a lot more about our you know, styles of worship and what our preferences are than what worship really means. And so we're going to get into some of that, um, but that, that book actually was really helpful, um, and you may want to pick it up and check it out. But, but it, uh, the podcast asked a couple of good questions, and, and one of them uh, was this. A lot of people would say, well, I don't really need to know theology. I just need to know the Bible, <laughs> which is kind of, you know, we would smile. But some of us are like, yeah, I'm, I just need to know my Bible. But the theology helps us put categories on the things that we're learning in the Bible. And so the, these things actually fit together very nicely. And, uh, and th- th- theology is, it helps us think about the Bible in organized ways. Uh, and so it's not some weird thing for just really smart people. We all have theology, whether we want to admit it or not. We just maybe have bad theology. We want to have better, good theology that's accurate. Okay? No one said amen. amen. Okay. Uh, literally, the word theology means God words, and so it's learning about who God is is what the word theology actually means, and it matters because God matters. So, so I studied theology uh, in in school, and and I learned a ton. But I got to tell you, I learned a lot more not in school than I learned in school. So there's just something about spending time with the Lord and spending time with His people over time that helps you to grow. Um, now, many Christians these days aren't really sure what they believe about some of the key elements of theology. So just a little bit of proof. Uh, there were a couple of questions that, that were asked, and, uh, and in this podcast, they talked about this, but asked of evangelical Christians. Uh, God, here, here's one. God learns and adapts to different circumstances. So in other words, God is still figuring it out. Uh, 48% of evangelical Christians thought that God is still growing and learning. That was interesting. Um, God accepts worship from all different world religions. So that's, you know, some of us might be like, hey, yeah, well, maybe no. And uh, 56% of evangelicals that were surveyed said, yeah, he does. Wow. Uh, here's, Here's another one that was pretty scary. Uh, Jesus was a great teacher, but was not necessarily divine. And 43% of evangelicals said, yeah, I agree with that, which, which grew from three years ago. It was only 30% three years ago. So we're seeing changes even in our culture, even in our Christian culture, where people are uh, not understanding certain really important concepts or are actually wandering away and kind of collecting uh, their belief system. So how do we decide what we believe? And so there, there are a couple of really important pieces of that. One is this. Scripture is how we decide what we believe. Now, we can interpret this different ways, and so one of the ways that this works is in community. We interpret Scripture together, not alone, because I could read this and go up on top of Tarantula Hill and come out with something weird. And then I could come down and talk to Edgar, and he would be like, uh uh-uh, that's not right. And that's how it's supposed to work, right? So scripture and community, and then we also trust that the Holy Spirit is going to uh, enlighten us, illuminate God's Word so that we understand what's happening. So we have the Bible, we have community, we have the Holy Spirit, and then we also have tradition. So if, if I'm up on Tarantula Hill and I have this whole brand new idea, and I'm like, hey, guess what? People have been wrong for 2,000 years. I'm probably wrong. <laughs> really. Uh-huh. But, but it happens all the time, and, and then I'll get a podcast, and I'll get a YouTube channel, and everybody thinks I'm the greatest thing because I have proven them wrong for the last 2,000 years. The problem is people had the Holy Spirit the last 2,000 years, yep. right. and I'm forgetting about that, right? Okay, amen? amen? Okay, so last week I talked about lint balls. If you missed it, you really missed something. But I feel like some people in our culture, the way that we collect our belief system is kind of like a lint ball in your house that just collects whatever is around on the ground, whatever's in the dryer, whatever the pets have left behind. And that is how we come up with a belief system. 
That does not make any sense. So we're going to do that differently. We're not going to be lint balls anymore. Amen. Amen. So, uh, right, on. right on. So today, our first topic is going to be God's existence, the nature of who he is. And it's going to be a blast. So uh, A.W. Tozer, one of my favorite writers, he said this. He said, um, the most important, what comes to your mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us. So I talked to my son about this last night, and I gave him this quote, and I said, what do you think? And then he gave me a couple of exceptions to the rule, and then he's like, well, actually, those aren't exceptions to the rule. I think you're right. So when you think of God, what do you think? Whether you're right or wrong, it shapes who you are, and it makes a really huge statement about the trajectory of your life. That is a, that is a heavy quote. So let's get to know this God that we are talking about. Now, just a disclaimer, we could spend the next year doing a subject on the nature of God and the character of, of who he is, right? right? So we're not going to do that, but we could. So that means I will leave out a few things today that you think are really important. And you'll be like, come on. And so that's why... It's important for you to have ongoing conversations about these things with those around you, your family, your friends, uh, and do some more research on your own. And, and just know that I will not cover everything in the next 30 minutes. Okay, we're good? Okay. Um, and if I could cover God in 30 minutes, he's not God. That's just true. Okay. Isaiah 40. To whom will you compare me, the Lord speaking? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes and look at the heavens. Who created all of these? He who brings out the story, starry host one by one and calls forth each of them by name because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. How many stars are there? Does anybody know? 10 to the 24th power is the estimation. Um, that's a big number. You can see it. it's a fairly big number. So that is uh, a bigger number than every grain of sand on every beach on planet Earth. That's how many stars there are. How many galaxies are, are there? The number keeps growing, but now the, the guess is one to two trillion galaxies. So wait, what? Yeah, one to two trillion. And our Milky Way is a small one, and it's uh, 6,000 light years across. So if our entire solar system was North America, uh, I'm sorry, if, if our galaxy, the Milky Way, was North America, our solar system would be fairly insignificant. It would be like a quarter in the Milky Way galaxy, which is one of a trillion galaxies. And like, really, wow. And so the, the nearest galaxy is about 2 million light years away. And then if we wanted to get to the next group of galaxies, the cluster, it would be 60 million light years to get there, if you could go at light speed, which I can't. So this is massive. And, and the God that we are learning about made it because he felt like it. And he thought it would be beautiful for us to look at. And he just wanted to show his creative genius in putting it all in a, in a way that it works. And it's spectacular, and we keep learning each year, how spectacular it really is. And I love the verse how he says he calls each of them by name. They're important to him. Psalm 8, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? What a great question. So I remember being up in Montana and looking up at the stars and going like, I didn't know there were that many. And we were watching satellites and we were watching shooting stars and we were watching all kinds of cool stuff. And in a way, it made us feel tiny because we're like insignificant in comparison with all that. But it also, on the flip side, made me feel really important that God cares about me and he made all of that. Like, what in the heck? So unbelievable power. I mean, one star can just obliterate us forever, just, and that's one. It's crazy to think about the, the delicate balance 
that hangs out there in just our solar system and in our galaxy and in the universe, and yet the God who made all of that is bigger than that and wants to know you? Yes, that's what this book says. And it's hard for us to wrap our mind around it, but it's important for us to wrap our mind around it because he is all that, and he's also wanting to know you. Wow, right? So, so the uh, theological term for that is transcendence and imminence. So he transcends everything. He's beyond time and space. He is sovereign. He is the king of the universe. He's also imminent, meaning he is present in time. He is present in your life. He cares when you pray about your sick relative. That just blows my mind, and it should blow our minds, because that is quite a contrast, that he is both of those things. We hold one in one hand. We hold the other one in the other hand. So the king, uh, the, the term for that that we like is sovereignty, the sovereignty of God. He does what he wants. He rules the way he wants. He rules everything. And then we think about imminence, and a good word for that is Emmanuel, God with us, God present with us. So Isaiah 55 is, is one of my favorite verses, but it, it says, My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, says the Lord. As the high, heavens are higher than the earth, we know that, so are my ways higher than your ways, my thoughts than your thoughts. There's another word for that called inscrutability, meaning his ways are beyond searching out. You can't, um, you can't really grab his ways and figuring them, figure them out, otherwise he wouldn't be God. Now, about Emmanuel, about his imminence, Isaiah 7, the prophecy about Jesus coming, says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And uh, I, I really like how the message um, transliteration does that. It says, the word became flesh and moved into the neighborhood. God moved into your neighborhood. That's, that's imminence. So in one hand, we hold reverence and awe. In the other hand, we hold relationship and intimacy, and we hold that tension as Christians. The, the God who could uh, make us never exist, and the God who is thankful that we exist and wants to be with us. Now, denominations, I, I went to Wheaton College way back, and uh, somebody asked a question in one of our uh, classes. It was a class on worship, and, um, and the, uh, one of the students wanted to kind of be angry and was like, hey, why does God allow all these denominations? Because they're wrong. It's evil that there are so many denominations. And, and he should just wipe them all out or force them to be together. And, was, and then the, the instructor had a really good answer. The instructor said... Um, I think that there are so many denominations because people appreciate different aspects about who God is. They appreciate different parts of his character. So one denomination might be all about his power, one all about his judgment, one all about his beauty, one all about his creation, his grace. And then you see these different denominations and groups splinter off because they feel like that is the most important part. So in a way, they're all sides of a gem, that's beautiful, and in a way, we don't get along very well. So it would be good for us to learn from each other and figure out a way to appreciate what another denomination says, wow, that is, that is pretty cool what you guys think. Amen. Now let's talk about the three O's. Um, and I got this graphic from our own Dale Johnson, thank you. And so uh, can you see that? So up on the top left, you have omnipresent, top right, omnipotent, the ones that are on a diagonal, and at the bottom, omniscient. So he's everywhere, he's all-powerful, and he knows everything. And then in the middle, we have a, a simple graphic of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all God, and uh, three entities that are part of God, three ways of seeing him. And so up at the top, we have some different characteristics that have to do with his power. And on the left... We have characteristics having to do with his love, and on the right, his holiness. And interesting, in Scripture, often it says holy, holy, holy. And holy doesn't just mean perfect. It also means other. It means separate. And, and so 
the, the statement is God is other than you, separate from you, and, and even more separate from you, and even more beyond, far beyond who you could ever be. And so holy, holy, holy is like how above and beyond he really is. That's why that, it keeps repeating like that. Um, and it also is a statement of perfection. And so this is interesting, though. Um, Dale and I were talking this last week about how sometimes you can grab a couple of these characteristics and, and use it for prayer. And you can say, Lord, I really need to understand your grace and, and your love right now. I really need to understand your holiness. I really need, I need your power in my life. And, and, and it can help us I'll, we'll put this out on the on uh, Facebook for you guys and on Instagram so you can find it this week and maybe in the in the uh, newsletter. But but I think it's helpful to look at um, uh, even two of the characteristics of God and and allow that to drive your prayer and and understand that He is the God who listens and acts and cares and who also knows before you ask what you need. It's kind of like as a parent, when have any of you have ever had a three-year-old? They think they know what they need. They don't. Often the parent says, no, here's what you really need. And so sometimes the kid will ask for a thing, and then we will interpret that and go, well, here's the, actually, this is, you need, you need dinner. You know, you, you don't just need uh, goldfish crackers right now. And sometimes we pray for goldfish crackers, the Lord gives dinner, and then we're like, what just happened? I don't get it. But in the long run, it makes sense. Okay, so um, often we associate one of those O's with one member of the Trinity. Um, and here's another word that you may not know, top left, immutable. And that, that's another word for unchanging that we find in theology sometimes, that and remember that, that uh, question that some evangelicals got wrong. Is God learning? Is he growing? Is he changing? No. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. You grow in your relationship with him. He doesn't grow and change. He, he, he doesn't need any help. So, so what is Trinity? Like at the, at the center of this, we have Father, Son, and Spirit. The concept of Trinity is clearly in Scripture, the word occurs later, after the, the Bible is finished, um, but it's just a, it's a fascinating subject. We're going to spend a little bit of time on that today. And our own Annie Barber wrote a book called The Fourth Chair and did a deep dive into what Trinity means. So I thought it'd be really cool if I interviewed her for a minute. Would you be all right with that? Okay. Hi, sis. Hey, this girl. is for you. Thanks. It's already on. Thank you. Isn't that cool? Magical. So, so uh, you're multidimensional. You can play keys and lead worship and also write books on theology. You don't no. have to answer that. <laughs> so uh, what, what, made, what inspired you to do a deep dive on the Trinity, first of all? Uh, long story short, a picture... Uh, came into my mind of four chairs, um, and not quite like that, although that's good. These chairs were in a tight circle facing each other, and there was a, an in, a implication as I received that picture that one of those chairs was for me, that each of the other chairs were for the persons of the Trinity. I found that a very curious picture, I was just minding my own business on a hike one day like every other day and to see a picture like this, and I went, I wonder what that means. Um, so it began a, a many year long journey with the Lord um, with all of the subsequent questions that started flying out of my little brain. I bet. Uh, right to him. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's why I started heading down that road in earnest. Yep. And then you wrote a book called what? Called the four chairs, isn't that something? Or the fourth, that. the fourth chair. The fourth chair, which is ours. <clears throat> yes. And then the other three are Father, Son, and Spirit. Yep. And He welcomes us to spend time with Him, to grow in relationship. Yeah, I, I think, and again, long story short, why would He give me that picture? Um, 
he, he goes out of his way in the word to tell us clearly that there are three persons who share a being, who share an essence, but all very distinct persons. And scripture tells me that I'm in relationship uniquely to each of those persons. Well, again, my head starts to hurt when I, you know, think about that. Um, but one of the disciplines, I think, in all these sessions that Kirk's going to be teaching us about is to let your mind hurt a little bit. It's okay. Um, it's okay not to understand, but that's a great launch place to start talking to the Lord. He wants you to know. So why does he tell us a little bit about this strange, incomprehensible thing in Scripture um, that gives us a glimpse into um, just one more of what are a myriad of things we can't ever really understand about him? But it must matter enough for you and I to know he is Father, he is Son, he is Spirit. They are in, and this is the key part for me that is really what this book is about, is they're in relationship with one another because we, dis we discover throughout the whole of Scripture that he is relational at his core. He is a relational God, first amongst himself. And then he draws us into that company to be relational with him. Uh, and that's a simple picture, uh, and yet something... Uh, beyond any of us to ever explain uh, to any degree. Um, but he, he wants us to know. Mm -hmm. um, and so he went out of his way in Scripture to, to tell us, and then we're invited to start a dialogue with him about it. So there's an ongoing conversation <coughs> with already happening in heaven, and then we get to join it. The, one, of the, one of the first things that amazed me is... Uh, and maybe you could relate and were like me in that when I approached God, I was the initiator. I'm the one that had something on my mind, and I would march toward him and start talking. Wake him up. Well, if, if I needed to, I would. <laughs> but the reality that he is three persons in relationship, communing within himself, completely changed my approach. Because now, if I come in with my yap open, I'm interrupting something that's already going on. <laughs> and um, not that I still wouldn't do that occasionally, but, um, but it would be rude. Uh, and so just a small, simple change of perception uh, from, I think, a limited perception to a slightly more illuminated perception all of a sudden, now as I'm approaching God, drawing near to him, I'm, I'm seeing him more in the fullness of who he actually is. And if there's already something going on, if there's already some dialogue taking place and I slip into my place in his company, I come differently than I used to come. I come with ears open with the chance, hey, he might actually, there might be something I should be paying attention to or yeah. whatever. How has it deepened your intimacy with the Lord, knowing this stuff? <clears throat> it's changed everything. It's hard to put it into words, honestly. Um, but, but one thing I never question anymore is how is, is his relational self. He is relational at his core. So it makes sense then that, that he wants to be in my life not to rule, though that's for my good. He wants to be in my life to relate to me. Um, he is offering me uh, companionship, communion. Yes, counsel. Yes, all the practical things that we usually come with our list, you know, asking for. But he, he's saying, I want, I want you to know me. And this God that we can't describe, who's bigger than we can possibly comprehend, um, who will never, if we lived, and we are going to live forever, uh, never tap the surface of the full breadth of who he actually is. But everything we learn will blow our minds. Mm -hmm. uh, and for him to know me altogether and still want me to come into his presence and reveal himself to me is uh, something I just, I would have to be a fool, and I have been that fool, mm -hmm. But I would have to be a fool not to run, to run 
to be near him. Nice. Love it. So we have Annie's book in the lobby on the left. It's free today, today only. Uh, grab one on your way out if you're interested in learning a little bit more. And chapter two lays a little bit of groundwork, a uh, little theological groundwork, right? So you don't want them to get stuck there. Yeah, it, you, it, when, when he reads you stats like he did earlier and you see how upside down our thinking is, um, we can't talk about being in, a, in a, a one of four chairs and not lay just a very rudimentary definition of Trinitarian theology. Um, and so just don't get bogged down in chapter two. It is rudimentary, but it'll give you enough of a framework to then get into what the book is really about, and that's mm -hmm. being in relationship with him. So awesome. Thank you. You're Would welcome. you thank Annie? You're welcome. So interesting, as we think about Trinity and other world religions, remember one of those stats was you know, hey, God doesn't really care where the worship comes from. It's interesting that if we look at Judaism, we look at Islam, we look at uh, Jehovah's Witness teaching, they don't believe in Trinity. There's no Trinity happening there. The, the Son and the Spirit are not divine. If we look at Mormonism, we find three gods, not monotheism. We find three gods with different purposes that relate to each other. And polytheism, in the end, multiple planets and universes and all kinds of stuff. So that, that it's interesting that not everybody believes the same thing. And it's really important for us to know what we really believe. Because Christianity is very unique. We recognize the divinity, the godness of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Because we believe that's what this book shows us. And because it lives out, it plays out in our lives. And so practically, we can see it working. So let's look at some verses about the divinity of the Spirit, uh, verses about the divinity of Jesus. Because if we spent today talking about Father God, period, that wouldn't be representing the nature of God that we know. Genesis 1, it's a good place to start, is in the beginning, right? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters, capitalized. And then moving down to verse 26, it says, And God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. Fascinating, right? Right out of the very first chapter of this book. And what does it mean to be created in His likeness? Part of it is to be, communed, uh, to be uh, created in community for community. We are created to relate to him and to each other. And part of being created in his image is having that part in us that needs relationship. Uh, the Holy Spirit, it's interesting as we go through Scripture, uh, can be lied to. Uh, it can be tested. He can be insulted. He can be blasphemed against. So this is not some impersonal, uh, he, can, he can be grieved um, it's not some impersonal force, as some people would like him to be. In fact, some New Age teaching talks about Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, and, and, and misinterprets a lot of this book to do it and says you need to get to know the Holy Spirit so that the Holy Spirit can lead you through life and et cetera, et cetera. But it's apart from Jesus. And the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit proceeds from Jesus. And the Holy Spirit is sent by the Father, and they relate to each other. Part of the Holy Spirit's job is to highlight who Jesus is. And Jesus said, unless I go, I can't send the counselor who's going to be with you forever. So that these things are all related. We can't just grab the Holy Spirit and forget the other two. It does not make sense. So let's, let's talk about uh, G the divinity of Jesus. So this is one that's kind of hotly contested and... And some people would just say, you know, I don't know if he's really divine. I don't know. If we read Scripture, and, and most people who would say that are not really reading, because it's all over the place, the divinity of Christ. Uh, John 1 is a great place to look. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. We could just, like, go, go home. Like, it's, it's right here. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. 
Without him, nothing was made that has been made. How many things were made apart from Christ? Okay, that's fairly clear. Uh, verse 14, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And look at this. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and full of truth. And then remember in the Christmas story, Matthew 1, Luke 1, the angel appears to Joseph and says, hey, you're going to have a son, but it's not really yours, right? And the angel appears to Mary and goes, hey, you're going to have a son, but Joseph ain't the dad. So virgin birth was planted there uh, and happened in, in her life and shows the divinity of Christ predicted by the prophet Isaiah. 700 years before this ever happened. Like, yeah. wow, virgin birth. Now, some people have gone really far and have said, well, Mary didn't have other, any other kids. We know that's not true. Scripture shows Jesus had brothers and sisters. And then some people have said, well, her, she must have been virgin birth too. And there's some things that some churches have gotten a little bit weird with. Um, and so we know that Mary was a pretty regular lady with a ton of faith who had a divine child and the Holy Spirit uh, brought Jesus into the world in human form. And that is pretty new. That is pretty, like, game-changing, right? right that the, the Lord of the universe would walk around in, in human flesh. Okay, let's look at um, Mark 14. The high priest, this is when Jesus is going to go to the cross. He says, are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? I am, said Jesus. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. That's not a prophet. That's not a man. He's talking God language. And the priest knew it, and it says right after that, he tore his clothes, and then Jesus was condemned. If you have any more questions about Jesus' divinity, just look it up. Just Google it. Verses about Jesus' divinity. You could also read Colossians chapter 1, starting in 15. Wow, is it clear? It is, you can't really get around it. Um, now, there also are verses in Scripture that talk about all three persons of the Trinity. So, Matthew 3 is a really good one. This is Jesus' baptism. He's being baptized by John the Baptist. And it says, as, Jesus, uh, as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened. He saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. We see the Trinity operating together, having a conversation right here. And then look at the baptismal formula from Matthew 28. Go and make disciples of all nations. And look, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. How many of you have been baptized this way? So, the words are not magic, but the words are important. Understanding that you are baptized into an understanding of a triune, a trinity, uh, that, that is God, the God we, we love and serve. And, and it's just this foundational piece, and maybe it's hard to understand, and people have tried with different um, uh, metaphors and pictures and you know, water can be ice and water and steam all at the same time, and an egg has a shell and a white and a yolk, and, and a person can be a son and a father and, and, a, and, um, and a brother. And all of these analogies and metaphors fall short. So better than that is, as Annie was saying, just lean into the, the, the having, having it hurt your brain a little bit and say, Lord, there are some things about you that I'm never going to understand, but help me to love you like crazy and help me to grow in my understanding of you. Right so how many of you are married or have ever been married? Okay. So over time, do you get to know the person a little better? <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> so don't expect to get to know everything there is to know about the Lord easier than someone that you're married to. It's going to be a little bit harder because he's holy, holy, holy. He's other, other, other. He's different than a human. So, man, if you have trouble getting to know your wife or your husband, it, it's going to be a little bit more time taken to understand the complexity of who God is. And yet, he wants to know you and he wants to make it easier on you over time. 
So, so it's not that we give up, but it is that we understand there are things I'm not going to get, and that's okay, because I'm a human being, and I'm leaning in, and I'm learning and growing, Amen. right? Okay, good stuff. So let's talk about a few uh, common misunderstandings about who God is. One, I grew up with this one. I thought God was kind of the out-of-touch grandfather in the sky. And he didn't like what I wore and the music I listened to because he is just out of touch. And (laughs) am I the only one? You're making me feel bad. But, But as I've learned... In, and pressed into my relationship with God, I realized, like, no, he is the opposite of the out-of-touch grandfather. He, he created things. He sustains things. He moved. He's the, he's the prime mover who makes things happen on planet Earth. And he's not really worried about my baggy jeans or my ear piercing. That's really not his concern. His concern is much bigger than that, right? Okay. The next one is this. Sometimes we think Jesus is our buddy. And so we just think, like, (laughs) I'm just going to get rid of this whole transcendence and awe and reverence thing. Uh, One of the reasons why I really like meeting here at this property is the stained glass, the the pews, the the nature outside. It just feels more reverent. And, And I love to be here to pray and to be with all of you guys. But, yes, we, Jesus calls himself our friend. And he's also the creator of the universe. And apart from him, nothing was made that was made. So, so I am not going to treat him like my buddy. I'm going to be surprised, grateful, humbled that he wants to call me friend. And I'm going to approach him with please and thank you. And sometimes people like, they're like, well, you just got to tell God what he's got to do because he said it here and you got to remind him of his word and tell him what he's got to do. And I'm like, no, I'm not comfortable with that. And I doubt he is. So please and thank you. And yes, sir. And right on a little respect. Okay. Um, Sometimes we believe that God is obligated by our behavior to answer our prayers. And we think, man, if I did it right, he had better come through. And if he doesn't come through, then he's not powerful enough or he's not loving enough. And I'm like, wait a minute. We are bratty Americans who are so entitled that we think God has to play by our rules? Like, that's a mess. That we somehow think that God should behave like I do. And God should be fair and equitable. And if I do my part, he had better do his. That's just... That's not right thinking. That is not right thinking about our creator. Man, oh man. Some people think that the God of the Old Testament is different than the God of the New Testament. And so these things are just totally a different person, just clearly. I actually took a class in seminary on that, and it was called Gospel and Kingdom, and it talked about Old Testament judgment and New Testament mercy. And it was fascinating because we realized that there are more verses in the New Testament percentage-wise about judgment than in the Old. You wouldn't think that because you always look at the Old Testament like, man, God was mad. (laughs) And then look at Jesus. He's so nice. (laughs) I want that one. I don't want this one. But if we understand the entirety of this thing and not just pick and choose the verses that we are comfortable with, We understand that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't change. And and so he reveals himself through Jesus and walks around with people, and they get to see who the Father is like. I mean, Jesus said, if you've seen me, you have seen him. That's a lot different than I'm different than him. Right? Okay. Totally different thing. Um, Some people think that God exists for us. And that there's like this um, self-help God. He's, he's the deity who helps me get my stuff together. And, and we have to remember that, no, we exist to get to know him. Yes. He made you. You didn't make him. So we got to keep that uh, in line. I feel like sometimes, I said this a couple weeks ago, but people want Christianity without the side effects. So they want peace and joy, but, but not the dying to self. 
not the taking up our cross and following him, not the becoming more Christ-like over time. We have to have both. We have to understand that he wants to make us more like him so that we're useful in the world. He wants to give us peace and joy, yeah, but it, not at any cost. It's not a pill that we take. It's a life that we live. It's a road that we go on. Okay. So I feel like I had this picture in my mind of a fast motorcycle. And so um, I have a friend that had a really fast Ducati. And, um, and one time I was meeting with him over at Pete's Coffee. And I said, could I go on it? And he goes, you mean drive it? And he had this look in his eye like, do you know what you're doing? And I'm like, I don't really know what I'm doing because I haven't ridden one since I was like 17. But would you take me on the back? And he goes, you know, we don't really do that with guys. <laughs> and I was like, but, you know, what if I don't tell anybody? And so, so he said, okay. So, so he took me around. I'm not going to tell you who it is. but So he took me around his Ducati, and it was remarkable how fast that thing could go and how it handled, and it was incredible. And, but it was a little weird holding on to a guy, like, going through that. But anyway, so, so he made me promise that I wouldn't tell, you know, who it was. But so here, here's the picture, though, that I had in my mind, is sometimes we want to drive and we want Jesus to be on the back. And we're like, just come with me wherever I'm going and make sure that I'm successful. And Jesus is like, you don't get it, do you? And, and we have to get to this place of saying, like, Lord, I want you to take me where we need to go and tell me what to do. And there are times when he'll say, hey, you want to drive for a minute? And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, okay, go right, go left, go straight, speed up, slow down. I need to have a relationship with him where he's leading, not me, right? right? So how many of you ever heard the song, Jesus Take the Wheel? Okay, so I want to show you just a little funny, see if you appreciate this. Jesus, take the That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> now, you will never be able to forget that, that little moment. But, but we have to say, you are the one in charge. Part of this whole study of who God is, is understanding that we are not him. Yes, right on. He drives, he leads, he steers, he decides. And then I come in line with that, and my life is blessed and fruitful. But when I fight for the wheel with him, we crash, right? Yes. How many of you have crashed? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> now, there are a lot of arguments to prove the existence of God. We could take three weeks on that. But just really quickly, you're not crazy if you believe in the existence of God. There are people far smarter than we in this room will ever be that believe that God is true and have like philosophical and scientific foundations for those things. Um, and there are all kinds of different arguments, but just a, a couple of fun things if you want to look into it more. Look into the first cause. What created everything? Uh, look into the argument of morality. Why do we know that there's right and wrong? Because if there's no God, I should just be able to do whatever the heck I want and not feel bad about it. And, it doesn't need, and if I hurt you, kill you, maim you, whatever, there's no morality. It doesn't matter. We all go, wait, wait that's not true. Why? Uh, another one that's interesting is just design. And if we look at the stars and the galaxies, and Timothy Keller says it this way, there, there are um, uh, innumerable dials that have to be all calibrated perfectly for a planet Earth to work. All kinds of things, all ki the laws of physics, everything has to line up just perfectly for you to have enough oxygen and enough gravity and enough heat, and enough moisture, and enough everything to survive. And so uh, if you want to look into that more, um, it's also called the fine-tuning argument. Timothy Keller did a good job talking about that. But maybe the best proof, and there are a bunch more, maybe the best proof that God exists is that we know it. There's something in the heart of a person that goes, there's something bigger than me. Something bigger than I, I guess that's correct English. But there's, you know, I'm not alone. Something made all of this. Something is, can be known. Someone can be known. And there's some reason for my life to have purpose. 
And people around the planet throughout the centuries have always looked for some kind of a divine being to serve, to understand. And that's probably the best argument that God exists. And here's the thing. We all worship something. And you could fight me on that afterwards. I'll meet you outside by the, by the bike racks. But we all worship something. Sometimes it's just ourselves. It could be kids. It could be work. It could be money. It could be success, peace, escape. We all worship something. The question, and, and the, the good question is, you get to decide. what you, Nobody decides it for you. You can decide what or who you worship. And so, and not deciding is a decision because you fall into the next thing that's next to you and you just worship that for a while and then the next thing and then the next thing and the next thing. How much better to worship and appreciate the maker of your soul who knows you and loves you and has a plan for you and wants to go before you and pave the road for you and make your life mean something? Yes, please. So Hebrews 11, it says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. And look at this next part. Because anyone who comes to him must believe he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. So there's a step of like, God, I believe you're there. And I believe that you can be found. And I believe that you'll reward me if I show up and I want to get to know you. Reward reward me with your presence, with your peace, with your purpose with direction for my life. That, it says it right there. Right How many of you know Jeremiah 29, 11? Did you raise your hand? Do you know what comes next? The next two verses are pretty remarkable. Uh, it says, then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen. You'll seek me and find you when you seek me with all your heart. That last verse occurs a few times in scripture, Old Testament, New Testament. When you seek him with your whole heart, you'll find him. And so some people think, you know, the Christian God is so mean and judgmental and just wants to save, send everyone to hell and this is all. And I just come back to this, like, are you seeking him or not? It's on you, dude. It's not on, don't blame God for doing stuff. What about you? If you want to get to know him, you can. If you want to seek him, you will find him. And open up your heart and say, I want more of you, God, show me yourself. And, and don't say, but it has to be on my terms. There's no PS. It's God, I want to get to know you. I will, I will pray. I will lean in. I will go with your people. Teach me who you are. And he will meet you there. That's just how it works. So I want to ask the band to come back up. We are thankful for you, band. Um, so I want to just ask you the, these two questions. And, and uh, we're going to... We're going to wrap up the teaching with this. How well do you know this God that we've been talking about? And let me, let me throw out another quote. Someone once said, a wise man knows what he doesn't know. So hopefully you've sat here and just like me studying this week, I learned some things I didn't know. And I like learning things I don't know about something so important as the nature of God. So so how well do you know him? And you might say, I'm just scratching the surface. You might say, I've been on this journey for a while, but man, I need to know more. And just say, Lord, would you show me what you want me to take away from today? What do you want me to notice about you that I've been ignoring? Sometimes we grow up with, remember the denominations thing? Sometimes we grow up with a God who's angry and and staring down from heaven and he's ready to strike you with lightning. And maybe you need to experience his grace and his love and his freedom and say, Lord, I need that today. Now, now maybe you've been walking with buddy Jesus and you're like, oh, Lord, I'm feeling convicted. I need to understand how holy you are. I need to have a good dose of awe and reverence. So, man, I want to spend some time with you this week and say, holy, holy, holy. Please teach me more about who you are. So just just pray for a second and just say, Lord, what is it that you want me to walk away with today about who you are? And Lord, we ask that you would show us here in this room and those who are listening online something about you that you want us to notice. 
that you want us to appreciate, that we'd grow in our love for you, that we'd grow in our understanding of who you are, that we'd be blown away that you are Father, Son, and Spirit, that you are the sovereign King of the universe, and you want to be in our little lives. And maybe if you're in this place or you're watching and you have never given your life over to this God, he came in the person of Jesus so that you could be at peace with him forever. And he gave us the gift of his Holy Spirit to walk with us through this life. And if you've never said yes to him, maybe this is your day and just say, man, I want to I wanna know you more. I want to seek you with all my heart. And just, it's pretty simple to say it, and then it takes a whole life to live it out. But just admit that you're a sinner and that you need a Savior, that you have done wrong in your life, you've walked away from God, you have not done it all right. And just admit that. And then thank Him and say, Jesus, thank you. You came on a, you came not just to be a cute baby, but to die on a cross, to wipe out sin, past, present, future so that I could walk in communion with you, Father, Son, and Spirit, and say, Jesus, I accept you. Be my King. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. And then the last step of that thing is say, please, Lord, I need you, not just in the past to make me clean, but I need to walk with you now. Power, empower me with your Spirit. Fill me with your Holy Spirit from this day forward that I could walk in newness of life, born again with you forever and someday, Lord, to be face to face with you. And if you prayed that prayer uh, today, I just ask that you would, um, I want to have everybody just keep your eyes, uh, your eyes closed and, and looking down. But if you prayed that prayer today, just look up at me so I know what God's doing in the room. And if you're out online, uh, just send us a send us an, an email, info at Caneo Church. We would love to help you get started in following this, this Lord that we've been talking about. Amen, everybody. Amen. So we should thank the Lord for at least two people who said yes to him today. So <laughs> So last week, uh, as we took communion. Uh, I, I reminded everybody of a challenge, and we are looking for uh, a number of people here at Caneo that are willing to commit to live out Acts 2 now and to be the core of our church to lead the charge for everybody else. What does that mean? That means that you're going to be devoted to being with Jesus and with each other, so you have to deal with people, right? It means you're going to be devoted to growing and prayer and communion. It also means that you're going to be devoted to living a generous life with your time and your resources. And if you're willing to say yes to those things, we want to call you a part of the core of our church. And, and it's not like this doesn't help you get into heaven. But what it does is it helps, it helps you say, I'm going to be committed to this group of believers for a little while. They're going to be my family of faith. And Lord, I ask that you would plant me here and that you would grow my life and help me to be fruitful. So if you're willing to do that, we have these planter boxes on each side. Just grab a seed as you come up, plant it in the soil, and just pray, God, would you use my life and make me fruitful here and now? Amen? And then uh, as you come up, you can take communion. We're going to come down the side aisles today, and you can go plant seeds if you would like to, and then take communion in the middle. Everything is gluten-free up here. You can do intinction or you can take one of these communions to go and just enjoy your time with the Lord. Come when you're ready.